So in this video, we are going to have a look at how do we configure the Cisco ISR 4000 series router as a Cisco Unified Border Element and how do we integrate the Cisco Unified Border Element with the IT service provider. What are the basic commands that are needed actually, you know? So hi guys, my name is Amit Singh and welcome to my channel. I hope you guys are enjoying this series of cube integration with the IT service provider and if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel please do so and share this information with all your good people that you think might need help all right so without any further ado let's get quickly started in today's session okay so let's just take a look on our next part which is configuring the the itsp side of the configuration where we'll be configuring the cisco isr 4331 as a queue you know so what essentially is needed or what we are having is basically we are having something called as a cisco unified border element and this border element has two interfaces. This is the first interface that's called as a LAN interface. And then there is a second interface called as a WAN interface. Okay. Now let's just understand this LAN interface is going back to Cisco Unified Communications Manager. And then it's connected to an IP or IP phone and of course there will be switches in between and everything inside the LAN environment but just I'm just giving you a, a high level overview of what we are going to do now so we will be configuring this interface you know and we will be configuring this interface and then we will be configuring the basic SIP configuration on the cube and then we will be configuring the LAN dial peers. So the dial peers that are needed to accept and send the calls to and from the Cisco Unified Communications Manager. And then we are gonna configure something called as a WAN dial peer. So ITSP dial peers, you know, so to send the calls to the service provider and receive the calls from the service provider. So this routing of the calls or you could say the VoIP routing is done or it's done with the help of something called as this dial peers. Okay. And in SIP environment, it's only and only and only VoIP dial peer. Okay. So there is no POTS dial peer in this SIP configuration or when you have a SIP trunk. Okay. So only VoIP, there is no POTS dial peer. All right, now we understand that this interface is, as I told you, it's gig zero slash zero slash zero. It's the LAN interface and the WAN interface is gig zero slash zero slash one. Okay. I will be giving you a brief overview about what each command in the SIP configuration uh, does, you know. And apart from that, let's also have a look about what is the requirement of the service provider for this specific SIP trunk. All right. So I have already discussed this in my first video about SIP trunk, but uh, let me tell you again so that we remember what it is, you know, and what you should ask the service provider for the information so that the implementation of the SIP trunk is really easy for you guys. So let's take a look at some of the questions and their answers for the service provider requirements. So here are some of the requirements of the service provider. And the first requirement is what is the IP address on which I would be sending the invites to, you know, so I have a dial peer, I have a cube, it's, it's having an external interface but what is your IP address, Mr. Service Provider, where I should send my SIP invites? And the service providers answering that, please send me the SIP invite to this IP address. 
a lot of time you will not have a static IP address as well. The service provider says, okay, this is my DNS proxy and this is my uh, DNS name and this is uh, the SIP registrar server, you know. So please send the invites by resolving the FQDN to the IP address because it's a dynamic IP address that it resolves to. So every time you have to um, query for the registration and also for the call authentication and to send the invites to, you know. So make sure you know from service provider what it is. Is it a DNS registration and, uh, you know, the calls are being sent to a dynamic IP address using a DNS proxy or is it just a static IP address configuration that you get from service provider. Okay, the next thing that you should ask your service provider is do you need a secure trunk or an unsecured trunk? So mostly the, the question is on the customer side, Mr. Customer XYZ, do you need a secure SIP trunk or do you need an unsecured SIP trunk and that should be fine. And the customer says, okay, I'm all right with this 5060 because it's my own connection and my I'm okay for that for now. So that's that's why this TCP SIP connection goes over port 5060. And then please do ask every time, accept my TCP connections or would you work on my UDP connections? All right. So this time the provider says I'm using a UDP connection. And the next very important thing is what is the kind of codex that you support? Do you support G711U law? Do you support G711A law? Or do you support G72264? Or if there are any other protocols that you support, please do let me know. Because if the protocol mismatches, then you have audio problems. Audio connections are not working. Your negotiations are not better. There, it's a problem, you know. And then the frac, fax protocol. Are you supporting T38 or not? Or do you still want my connections to be G7-11 or anything? Then the DTMF signaling mechanism. Do you want RFC 2833 or uh, are you, you know, SIP or what are you supporting? Please let us know the DTMF because if the DTMF signaling is not supported then you have problems for example people are dialing out to a, an hotline outside your company and the hotline is asking to press one or digits one or two to uh, reach the particular service and people are not able to uh, you know reach those services because the the dmf signaling is mismatching be between your cube and between your provider you know and then if my provider needs an early offer or the delayed offer. So here it says I need an early offer from Q. So what does it mean? What is a early offer? So basically early offer is where the cube will send or my invite will be sent with the SDP information. So what are the informations inside the SDP? So my connection informations, my media informations, the type of uh, Codex, audio, video, DTMF, you know, all these informations are sent in my first invite. And what is a delayed offer? In the delayed offer, you do not send all this information. So you do not send any UDP, you know. So, oh, sorry, no, uh, SDP. So basically your invite will be where the content length is equals to zero, right? In the delayed offer or the invite without an SDP would look like content length is equals to zero. Okay. The next thing that we are going to talk about is the IP address of my interface of my cube or the external interface of the cube from which the provider should receive um, the invite you know, the source address from which the invites would be sent to the provider. So here, as you see, as we already discussed, it's gig 0 slash 0 slash 1 and the IP address is 10.1.40.x that we'll be seeing. And then it says, as I discussed initially, does the SIP trunk require any registration for each of the DIDs? No, because it's a simulation, so we don't need it. I would try to simulate a lab where we could register 
these DIDs as well. Okay, but for now it's a simulated lab, so you do not need any SIP trunk DID registration. So let's move further and see. The next requirement is this if the service provider requires a digest authentication, if you know it needs to authenticate each and every call and then it says no i don't need it you know and then does the provider supports the mid call codec renegotiation and the provider says yes i do support right what is this mid call codec renegotiation that means for example my call i called or someone called me from the pstn number and then i picked up the call on my jabber and then i said okay let's wait or just wait for a second i will you know uh, ho uh, transfer your call to someone else let's say okay so during this what the person does is presses a button um, uh, of transfer you know and then the person on the other side side gets on hold at this point of time the cucm will then send an update signaling and then um, you know uh, there has to be a renegotiation of the codex and everything this would be sent to the service provider so if service provider supports those kind of renegotiation or not you know so we have to understand this from the service provider and the service provider says yes i am i am okay with that i could support it and then the service provider says I would need your call from the specific calling number and what is that calling number that's this calling number I would accept only the calls from this main number so basically you could modify in, in one of your SIP informations that the provider only sees this number so that it could authenticate the call but it would still display the right calling number to the other people you know in the PSTN world so this is just for authentication so you could maybe modify p asserted identity or from header or whatever so that the service provider at least sees this number and then it says okay the the call is right it's authenticated and then i would still show the right calling number um to the pstn end user so that they are not confused what this number is all about okay so quite a long theory i think now let's get started with the practical and then let's start with the basic sip configuration on the cisco isr 4331 so the first thing that we should check on the cube is first of all let's say what is the ios version on the isr 4331 you know so let's do show version and it says we are on Cisco iOS XE software version 16.903. So it's compatible for the cube and we do not need any smart licensing. I think the smart licensing starts with the version 16.10.x. The next important thing that we could check is to show inventory. And it will show us all the hardwares. So these are all the hardwares. We have a chassis, we have a power supply, we have a fan, and then the important thing we have the PVDM. That means we have a DSP module. And which module do we have? We have something called as PVDM 432 voice DSP module. And why do we need this DSP module? We would need this DSP module for transcoding of calls. So between negotiation of a codec between let's say if we have a codec mass mismatch between a provider and a cube or between a cube and cucm you know they're they are using different codecs so we could translate or transform not transform but you know we could negotiate and then um, do a codec negotiation so that there are no problems with the codecs then the next thing that we see that we have a nim network interface module which has a front panel three port gig ethernet module you know so we have a three gigabyte ethernet ports on this module and then when we do show ip interface brief we should also see the modules here as i said we have three gig ports this is gig 00 this is our lan 
interface that we have configured on the CUCM as well for the zip trunk destination IP address. And then this is used for the provider and we are not using this port as of now. So we have these two interfaces currently. Okay, so this is used for high availability between two cubes, but I'm not talking about it right now. So let's leave it for now. We just concentrate on these two interfaces. Okay, so the next important thing to understand is how do you enable a cube application on the on the ISR4331. So basically, the first thing that you would do is go into a voice service wipe command mode. So what it will do is it will allow you to enter the enter the commands related to wipe. Okay, be, even before I do this, one most important thing is you should check that there is a correct UCK9 package. Okay, so that's that's um, that is UCK9 package. Okay, so why is this used? This UCK9 package has a code that is needed to run the voice configuration on this ISR. 4331 router. So how do you check this? So you would just say show license and then here you should see here that there is a feature called as UCK9 inside this package and then it's eval right to use because it's in evaluation mode so it's fine but uh, it's a different topic altogether. I mean, if you have ordered it from Cisco, then it will, after eight weeks, it will automatically convert to right to use as of now. But from 16.10 and onwards, it will not be, I think 16.10 or maybe 16.13. I don't know the right version, but it would not be right to use anymore. So it would be a smart licensing. All right, so make sure that you have the right UCK9 package or you have the UCK9 package so that you could run the voice commands. Okay, after this, you could go into the configuration mode and then we will do voice service wipe. What does voice service wipe does? It will allow us to run the wipe commands. And then the first thing that I will do is mode border hyphen element license capacity i will just say 20. okay and then what it does is it will configure uh, this router to help you run some command for example then you could run this command do show cube status and then you will be able to see the cube version which is 12.1 version that we are running and then it's different than the software version so what is this cube version so what cisco is trying to do is it's trying to match the cube software versions with the cisco unified communications manager version okay so that's why they have now changed the cube version to match the cisco unified communications version so that's why you see a different software ios version and the cube application version and then we have configured the license capacity as 20 using this command more border element license capacity 20. The next thing is to secure your cube. And how do you do this? You configure something called as an access list. It's not really an access list, but it's something called as a filter or whatever, wherein you would say, uh, let's say, um, yeah, it's, it's a filter list I can say, okay so that you allow only those IP addresses that you think are legit. You know, you do not allow all the other IP addresses to enter into this cube. And how you would do this? You would do this by doing something like IP address trusted list. And then in this list, you will enter all the IP addresses that you think are good to be um, allowed you know so that they can communicate with your cube so external IP addresses or 
internal IP addresses that you think are legit and should be communicating with the queue. And how do you do this? You do IPv4 and then just hit uh, question mark and then here it says it's just the IP addresses that you think are okay. So as of now I will enter two IP addresses. One is the IP for the service provider, you know. That's the IP address from the service provider that I will allow and then the second IP address is 198.18.133.3 So you have allowed these two IP addresses. Actually, even if you don't allow these IP addresses, it should be fine because uh, you know, you would be configuring this IP addresses in your dial peer. So the IP addresses that are part of your session targets uh, may need not be in your IP address trusted list. They are already trusted because you are saying, okay, open this connection to this IP address or send a request to this IP address, you know? So they are already trusted. But just to let you know what is the use of this IP address trusted list, or sometimes you do a subnet um, trust. So sometimes you do IPv4, Let's say if you are from service provider, if you want to trust the subnets from the IP service provider because the SIP registrar IP address is a dynamic IP address because you are using a DNS proxy. So you would do something like 10.1.0.0 so that any IP addresses in this range will be trusted, you know. So once this is done, the next command that you should run is to allow a SIP to SIP connections from service provider to cube and then from cube to CUCM. So you will say allow connections SIP to SIP. That's it. You do not need to allow any other connection because there is no H323 connection. So this should be more than enough for you to allow the SIP trunk communication. I forgot to tell you something again. Uh, you might have seen here a statement saying you need to save and reload the router, but it's really not needed. You know, even if you do not reload the router, the config um, is okay. I have done it a lot of times and you do not need to really reload this router just for this command mode border element license capacity. It's just to, what does, what does this command actually do is it will help you to see the cube version or run the show cube status command you know even if you don't have this command your SIP trunk will work without any problems so don't worry about it it's just for enabling your commands like do show cube status and uh, yeah that's it all right so now we have done one of the basic configurations you know of the cube the next basic configuration of the cube is under SIP is to allow some basic config so that you are um, you have no problem. So usually um, I also enable it and it's a recommendation from Cisco that you enable it so that there are some uh, there, there is no problem with your uh, SIP communication. So you usually will say header passing and then error pass through. So this means that, um, for example, error pass through is like if the cube is not able to understand some kind of error, it will just pass this error to the next hop, you know, so that maybe the next hop understands this error message. So the cube will not process that error. It will just send this error as it is. And the same thing for the header passing. So in case the cube is not able to understand some headers, it will just pass those headers without any processing. All right. And the next thing, uh, if you remember, there was a requirement from a provider. And the requirement was, um, you know, um, I need to send an invite with the STP information. That means I need to send an early offer. So what you would do here is at the global level, you will do early offer forced. 
So by this command, what happens is whenever there is an invite that is sent to the service provider, it will be sent with the STP information, the media information, the uh, connection IP information and everything else. Okay. And the next thing for the calls to work properly is I will say mid call signaling pass through. That means if there is any mid call features that that's happening, that means uh, let's say a call hold or um, a call transfer or something. So it will just uh, pass the signaling information without processing the signaling that happens during the mid call features. Okay. Okay, so I think uh, we have done the basic configurations that are needed for the SIP trunk. You know, yeah, there could be some more like SIP registrations and um, those are the things, but in this simulation lab, uh, we do not need the SIP trunk registration. So I would be showing this, you know, in my another video, maybe once we are done with this uh, SIP trunk or the call routing part and everything, you know, I would be going further and showing you how you could configure SIP tenants and uh, the DNS proxy registrations and number DID registrations and how could we check those informations and everything. But for now, let's uh, keep it simple. So let's move ahead for now. So for now we are we are we are completed with the basic SIP configurations that are needed for the calls to work. Going forward, we will um, configure the call routing part, so the dial peer and everything. So if I do, for example, let's say for now, if I do do show run pipe section voice service VoIP. So this is all the configurations that we have done right now. Okay, but it was a lot of explanation uh, behind that. So I wanted to make sure that you understand each and everything. So let's move ahead in our next video. And uh, in my next video, you will be seeing how do you configure a call, call routing? How do you configure a dial peer? And what are the features inside the dial peer necessary to complete the call routing? Okay, I thank you everyone for now and uh, we meet us in our next video thank you bye bye